to, the Indi Agenda. I regularly meet with the Prime Minister and his ministers on topics vitally important to Indi. Being independent means I'm a strong and uncompromising voice. I get a seat at the table and I get results. And then the news, the flyer outlines all the results that she achieves. Meeting with the Prime Minister, meeting with the Health Minister, meeting with the Treasurer, meeting with the Minister for Agriculture, and all the other, all the things she does at Canberra, all the funding she's got for the electorate, and then all the lovely things that she does within the electorate, she puts it out. And um, I am sure if you were interested and you went onto Zali Stegel's webpage, you would find her newsletter does exactly the same thing. It lists the real practical, pragmatic things that independents do. But what, what I love most about independents, I mean, of course they do things and they achieve things. But what I think they do is they take our voice unfiltered to parliament. And I just can't stress to you enough what a wonderful feeling it is to be in an electorate when you actually know that you're being represented. And I put it to you, am I frozen? No, you're good. You're okay. You, you can hear me. Worry, okay. Good. I'll put it to you that as an independent who um, represents their electorates, you, the community knows exactly how Helen Haynes votes and Zali votes. They put it up on their webpage every day and they know why they voted. But I say to you that your member of parliament who's a liberal, you've got no idea why he would vote the way he does and what are the influences on him. And I mean, how do the Liberals know how to vote? How do they form their policy? I don't know. I really don't. And I never knew when I was in Parliament. And most of the backbenchers never knew. They just got told every day by their whip that here's what the agenda was and here they were voting. And, I, I, and for the love of me, I still cannot understand how the National Party works out, how it's going to vote on any topic. But the thing is, the Nationals and the Libs all vote together. So the thing about voting for an independent is you actually know who your person is and why they're voting that way. So what can an independent do is they actually represent you in the most profound sense. And the Liberals and the Nats, and I think to that similar extent Labor, none of them represent their communities. And it's just profoundly, it's profoundly scary when you say it and know it's true because to be a member of a party, you actually sign on number one, and you pay money, but you sign on number one to be a member of the party and do what the party says. And sure, the Liberals say you can cross the floor, but you know, it just doesn't happen. So anyhow, that's, that's the answer. And I think if you come across people saying, you know, what do independents ever do? You, you could just ask them, well, they represent their community. Absolutely. Just, and then you could turn the question and say, and how do the Liberals, who do they represent? And I mean, who do the Liberals represent is such an interesting question. Yeah. So I'll leave that with you and I'm happy to talk more. But one of the things we used to do is in the early days of campaigning, when our, our volunteers would come together, we would run um, really good fun. Uh, we call them verbal karate workshops. And we'd get groups of us together and we'd um, workshop answers to questions. So one of us say like you, Denise, would throw up, a, you know, what do you say when? And then we'd workshop what the best answers were. And that we, when I talk about best, I mean, not only clever, but they were respectful. They didn't really talk about the opposition. Like I've just given the Liberals a bagging. You probably shouldn't do that too much. But then also, how do you, how do you turn the question back to the person who's asking you the question? So that's what we tried really hard to do is to, to answer the question very quickly and then say, well, that's what I think, but I'm really interested. What do you think? You know, what do you think, what would you like an independent member of parliament to do? And then you get other people talking and you get to listen. And that's a much better place to be than sort of me filling up all the airspace with what I think. Because, you know, people don't really care a lot what I think. They, they really want to tell me what they think. So anyhow, so if you haven't already done it, log on to Zali's webpage and you can get her email. And, and it's really useful to have a couple of copies of these in your bag. Um, and take when you when people ask that question, you can actually, you know, show them what independents do, and you don't have to make the argument. So their websites are fantastic. The independents' websites are very different from the party members. I've noticed. At, well, for mm. a start, they show straight up. They have a tab to their voting record, which mm. Trent does not, for example. Um, 
Tony asks, this is a good one, do rural and regional electorates not care about climate change? Is it an inner city issue as the Prime Minister likes to characterise it? <laughs> Isn't it gorgeous? And the Deputy Prime Minister, you know, oh, just a shocker. So, Tony, that's the, the really, I don't know if you, you guys get The Guardian online. I'm, pro you're prob I'm sure many of you do. But you might actually get a link to it because to, in today's Guardian, there was an article by a woman called Van Badham. And Van wrote this just really gorgeous reply to uh, Michael McCormick. Michael McCormick made all those comments about how, you know, country people don't care about climate and it's all a, it's all a you know, a woke thing from the inner city. And she described a meeting that she had in Wagga Wagga, 100 metres from his electorate office last month. And she described all the people she met in his own electorate and the, the issues that they cared about and the diversity that they cared about. And it was a really lovely, a really lovely article making the case that, of course, people in the country care about climate and, and farmers more than anybody. And there's a really lovely action group called Farmers for Climate Action. And they've got a web page and they're really active in talking about all these things. So yeah, it's just a it's just a it's a, it's a silly thing that the Nats, the National Party in particular does, uh, and then the, the libs pick it up to to imagine that people in the country don't don't care for. Like how could we not? Three quarters of the bloody country was burnt last year, and it was our country that was burnt. You know, so yeah, it's it's just a it's just a it's just a furphy. It's a bit like saying. Um, you know, don't vote independence because they don't they don't have a seat at the table, which is just just so not true. So I'm I'm happy to pick up that topic a bit more, but if you're really interested, read Van's article, and then the other thing, did someone put it up? And then Van, yeah. Van's article, and then I see Tina, you've done it. Thanks, Farmers for Climate Action, and that's why I think that independence is so popular in the country because we are just so over the really um, bad mouthing and bad naming. That some of the some of those members of parliament you know do to us it's just really off one story in your book kathy i remember reading you talked about and it changed my understanding of the national party you said you i think you went to dan t and you looked at some legislation for tertiary education which was going to affect your electorate and i would have assumed the national party would have a lens over all of all legislation a rural mm. lens a remote regional rural lens but you, that was not what you found, was it? No. So there's so much about when you get to parliament, you get shocked because you have a, assumptions about things. So, yeah, I had made, but it, it was on education. It was on childcare. It was on industrial relations. So I went to some of the guys that I knew in the, in the National Party and I said, you know, what, what's, your, what's your position on, say, childcare? Because the government was making all these changes to childcare. Um, I said, who do I go and speak to about putting some amendments up to make this work better? And the National Party guy looked at me and said, oh, no, we don't do childcare. And I said, yeah, yeah I know you don't because you're a bloke and blokes don't do childcare. But, you know, who do I speak to who's going to take the position up? And they said, no, no, Cathy, you don't understand. Um, we only look after the portfolios that we look after. If the Liberals have got the portfolio, we don't interfere with them. And I, and I really, I, I was so shocked. Yeah. So... Yeah, when it so came to this debate on childcare and all the changes, I was the only one in Parliament who spoke on behalf of the whole of rural and regional Australia about the impact of child, the changes to childcare on us, which made me really popular uh, among, you know, many, many women farmers, but, you know, really disappointed that the National Party um, don't have positions on things. Yeah. And they don't even have a position on one of their key elements, which is called regional development. There's no actual policy on regional development for Australia. So the National Party, they like giving out grants. So they have these big pots of money and they, they give out money, but none of it's based on need. None of it's based on a strategy for developing regional Australia. And then when you really dig big deep, it's a bit like the, the car parks. It's all based on, um, you know, port, you know, whatever we want to call that. So yeah, I was yeah. I was totally surprised, but it, it made the argument even more stronger. You need to be if you're not being represented directly, you can't assume that your party is going to represent you, mm -hmm. because they represent other interests, and we all know those interests are the ones who pay the money into the party machine. And that goes, 
Sorry, Kathy. That goes no. to a, a question we've got from Gavin, which is why can't anything tangible be done with holding the government responsible for their dodgy handouts like sports rorts, community grants and car parks? Yeah. Why can't so Gavin, anything tangible be done? Yeah. So, Gavin, when, when I got that question, I just thought, well, any anything tangible done by who? And I was wondering, the who were you, who were you thinking about? Um, because the who is us. And people sometimes get really frustrated that the media are not better. Well, you know, it's us. It's all going to be us. And it's each one of us, one by one, saying, no, that's not good enough. And there's a lovely, um, there's a lovely, you know, it's, it's, it's us, it's, it's the, 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 the politics of Australia responds at the current politics and the national and the, and the, um, the NLP, they really respond to the, um, the polling that they're getting. And if they don't think it's an issue, they don't respond. So part of the, part of the strategy of what we're talking about now of running independence and lots of them, and hopefully they're, gonna, they're effectively going to win is, is, that, is that really tangible way of saying to the government that we're not going to just we're not just going to use words and actions. We're actually going to use our vote to tell you that what you've done is not good enough. And I must admit, I love getting um, I get your social media from North Sydney, and you know your meetings and your pub walks and going down the beach, and you're becoming so visible on the topics that are important that the the government has to be picking up what's happening in Sydney. So. That's a really long answer to say that the best people to react to the badness of the government is us. And, and you do it through um, getting the publicity that you're doing in, in, in North Sydney. You do it in getting on your, your social media and, and, and tagging um, your member of parliament that you're not happy about it, ringing up the office. And I just have to, there's one, there's one particular topic that you know, I'm gonna take action on. Um, and just over the border from Albury Wodonga, but in, in Albury, is the member for Farah. And the member for Farah is the Minister for the Environment. And it just came out in the news today that the government, specifically the member for Farah, is going to appeal the decision by the courts. Do you remember just this week that the, the courts came out and said the Minister for Environment has got an obligation to protect the next generation regarding climate? Yeah. So the, the courts brought that decision down saying there was an obligation. And today, the Minister for the Environment said, we're going to appeal that decision. So I'm going to write a letter to, my, to Susan Lee and say, oh, Susan, you're on the wrong side of history with this one. You know, this is not worth, this is not worth, this is worth lying, fighting in a ditch over. This will come back to haunt you as a really, really bad decision. So I'm going to write her a letter to that effect. So Gavin, I think the answer is that at the moment, the most effective way I think that we can let the government know that we're not happy with them is by organising and then winning at the next election, really, really taking it up to them. And I know at the moment there's quite a few uh, independent groups and it, it just has to be that as, as we start growing in strength and um, being really out there in the public, that the, the machine that runs the Liberal Party will get very anxious about how it's going to spread their quite thin resources across all these electorates. And I think that would be a good thing. What about ICAT, Cathy? Wouldn't that be the longer term uh, umpire in the room or policeman? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. ICAC is really important, but um, we it's not just having an ICAC, it's the type of ICAC you get. And one of the things is the original draft that the government put up and it just got soundly beaten about the head and they pulled it back. It was, it was a really pathetic piece of legislation, really wimpy, minimalist. And the government did it at the minimalist just to say that, okay, we've got an ICAC. But everybody said, well, we don't want one. So we've got to be just a little bit careful. We want an ICAC, but it's got to be well-funded and it's got, to, it's got to be really rigorous because we don't want people being let off the hook just because you know ICAC couldn't bring a case or something. So I think when you talk about we need an ICAC, the ICAC that Zali um, and Helen Haynes are backing has got tremendous backing. So, and we want, the, we want that version. We just don't want a, a watered down Liberal National Party ICAC, or I don't want one. I'd rather not have one than have one that was just absolutely um, pathetic. And independently funded, presumably. 
Oh, absolutely. And staffed. Yeah, it's pretty basic. Um, yeah. Next question, if we move along. Question from Kim from Willoughby. Julia Banks has been in the news this week, as we all know. She was in Parliament when you were there. Tell us about this and how can we stop sexism in Parliament? <laughs> oh, that's a lovely question. Can, can, I was, oh, can I tell you a story about this? Last night, um, I was on a Zoom with a, uh, um, a book club. So the book had my book for discussion. And we, we did all, we all did a Zoom, just like tonight, but it was a book club Zoom, which was pretty funny. And it was, a, it was a lot of fun. But one of the questions I got asked was to explain how the coup happened and what actually happened with um, Julia Banks. And I, I, I tried to do it, but I've been thinking about it today and how sexism happens. And the nearest I got to was for those, those women listening tonight, and the guys can make their own analogy, but it's a bit like a netball competition. You know, if you're playing netball and you've got your two teams, you don't pay a lot of attention to what the other team is doing because they're doing their own thing. So in parliament, it's a bit like that. I, st I stuck to my team and I didn't pay a lot of attention to the, you hear the grumblings and you hear the bit of the bitching and the carrying on, but you know, I didn't pay a lot of attention to what the Libs and the National Party were doing. I, I had enough to do. But when that Malcolm Turnbull, Scott Morrison, uh, Peter Dutton coup happened, you know, I got, I got forced into, it was a bit like a huge big meeting in the middle of the netball court. But what, what was really interesting about it, it was the blokes doing it. And Peter, I don't think we could ever forget that Peter Dutton actually got 35 votes out of, I think there's about 85 people who could have voted. So he just got so close to becoming the prime minister. And it was like, oh no, that'd be, that'd be terrible. And then the Victorians basically liked Malcolm Turnbull. And we definitely preferred Malcolm Turnbull to Peter Dutton. So all the Victorian, I was talking to all the Victorians in the Liberal Party, and I say, gosh, you couldn't want Peter Dutton. You've got to back, you've got to back um, a Malcolm. Anyhow, and then out of the middle, um, you remember that Turnbull lost the numbers and Scott Morrison came up as the, uh, the, the middle candidate, sort of. And, and, and when, on the voting, in, it, when Scott Morrison won the election, the voting between Peter Dutton and Scott Morrison, it was 40 to 45. Like it was so close. So to think that 40, 40 of those Liberal Party people preferred it. Anyhow, Julia got caught in the middle of that. Wow. And the bully boys were there all right because it was like two teams, Dutton's team and Scott Morrison's team, fiercely fighting about which of their blokes would become school captain. You know, it was it was really, really nasty stuff. And and and, and if you can just imagine how nasty it was that um, Malcolm Turnbull, well, I mean, with all the power and influence of he's got, he got kicked out and it's left to the, the real rough, rough tumble blokes to sort of fight it out. So Julia was in the middle of that. And then she said, well, she voted for, she voted for um, Julia um, Gill, uh, no, the, the foreign minister. And oh, like Julie, yeah, Julie Bishop. Julia Bishop. Julie Bishop and Julie Bishop lost you know she so poor old Julia Banks was she you know she had no she had no credibility because she'd voted for all the wrong people and so then it became a bit like a divorce because you had the people who had lost the whole thing cracked up Julia Banks was on the wrong team and she said okay well I'm not going to I'm not I'll, I'll just stay here but I'm not going to go to Christmas and I'm not going to go to Easter I'll just do my little bit I'll keep my head down so she tried to do that, but they kept on saying, no, 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 you've got to turn up. And she said, well, I'm not going to turn up. It's too horrible. And they put so much pressure on her that she said, well, I'm, I'm actually going to leave this family. You know, I can't stay here. And at that, well, all that was happening. Um, it's a long story, but while all that was happening, us on the cross bench, we're just trying to keep out of the battle. You know, we were like the sisters-in-law at the Christmas party, not having an opinion. We <laughs> wanted to stay out of the family fight. But when we got a sense that Julia was a little bit interested, we all went, yeah, yeah, come over and be with us, you know, because it was me at that same, Karen Phelps, Kathy McGowan, Rebecca Sharkey, Andrew Wilkie. We're saying, yeah, yeah, come on our team. You know, we, we're really nice people. You know, you really belong here. And, and she did. She came across and she discovered it was true. She discovered that on the cross bench, there was people of integrity and calibre representing their communities. We didn't play politics. 